is now the time for the reading of God's holy word. We've been preparing our hearts all morning for this very moment. If you'd like to join with us, you can certainly follow along on the screen if you have a personal device or the actual book. I see a book out there. That's awesome. Feel free to. We're going to be starting with Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Our reader for this morning will be Sister Donna Dooley. But let us pray that God will help us by his spirit to receive the spiritual food he has prepared for us. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we turn to your word for us today. We ask that your Holy Spirit will rest upon us today. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, faithful in our speaking, resolute in our believing, and devoted in our living. For Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. So, um, we've heard a little bit about Ezekiel, so let's hear a little more. Um, Beth made a comment last week about, whoa, these scriptures, sometimes they just really hit you with, about some difficult things. So, Starting at um, verse 30, as for you, son of man, your people are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you, as they usually do, and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them to, into practice. Their mouths speak of love but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. When all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And Romans. In Romans, Paul had just uh, was talking about righteousness, and he just used a a big illustration about Abraham and Abraham's faith, and how that made him righteous, not just by his works, but by his faith alone. And so he continues um, by saying, "You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly." the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, per person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And Matthew Jesus is speaking to us here, um, having his little uh, usual uh, argument with the Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. I would love to hear this in our own language every day on the corner with somebody saying this, or how this would sound. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shredding the, shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Hmm. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know, sometimes you read passages like this and, and you go, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, <laughs> right? I mean, wow. Oof. So we're in the third of, of a four-part sermon series that I'm calling Questions and Answers. It's probably more accurately called Questions and Response because, you know, I'm certainly not fully answering all these things, but these are the kind of issues that I think, just a sampling of some of the things that you're neighbors and your friends and your co-workers your children your grandchildren nephews and nieces what they think about the church what they think about jesus and the bible and i'm just doing this not to try and teach you how to answer these things i just want you to understand there are answers to these things right the questions that so many of these people who fashion themselves as atheists and whatnot they they bring up these things as if Nobody had ever thought of this before, but these are questions that have been wrestled with by great men and women of God for 2,000 years. There are answers to these things. And as I was preparing this particular one, uh, you know, uh, this, Im this image of what's, what is fashionable today, it's called the mic drop, the mic drop moment. Does everybody know what that is? Okay, let me catch you up. The mic drop moment is when a performer of some kind, it started with rappers, you might have guessed when right when a performer of some kind says something or does something on stage that is so powerful or dominating or overwhelming that to signal that there's nothing more to say they just drop the mic right now the urban dictionary if you've ever seen the urban dictionary they define it a little bit differently they define it as an extremely expensive theatrical form of punctuation often done by performers who have never actually had to purchase a microphone right? <laughs> Because microphones are expensive. So what most people do, when you see, when you see people say something and then they go, yeah. that's, they're, they're pantomiming the mic drop, right? which is a lot cheaper way of doing it, which is good. So I, I've noticed that when I have conversations with people who, you know, do not think all that highly of God, they don't really care that much for the church, they don't think religion is all that great in general, uh, it's oftentimes where people like to pull out what they think are mic drop lines. And what they're intending to do is do a conversation stopper, right? They're tending to, they want to make a charge that they think is unanswerable, an accusation against which they think there's no defense. And as I mentioned, we've talked about a few of these already. Today, here's another big favorite. Ah, church. Isn't that just a bunch of hypocrites, right? You all heard this one before? right? Church, just a bunch of hypocrites. The good news is, I think this is actually like the easiest one to handle. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean if this shows up in conversation. The dialogue that you have might sound something like this. Yeah, you know, this is me. This is not me, right? This is me saying, yeah, you know, we go to this church. Oh, you go to church? Now in New England, it's usually accompanied by a snigger, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you don't, don't you go to church? Nah, church, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Now watch this, this is the fun part. Of course they are. That's the whole point. See what I just did there, right? And they might say, well, what do you mean that's the whole point? See, it's like verbal jujitsu, right? You know what jujitsu is? So when they said, what do you mean that's the whole point? That's like them saying, hey, hold on to my arm. I'm just gonna flip myself over, okay? Uh, seriously, the charge that, Church is full of a bunch of hypocrites 
is the easiest one to dispose of simply because it's, it's true. <laughs> now, here's the thing. It's not just true about church people. It's true about everybody. We're going to kind of un unpack some of that. And that's why it's another reason why it's easy to handle. So when we simply admit that, yeah, yeah of course, that's the whole point. We disarm, in a sense, our conversational partner. And then maybe, just maybe, you might be able to have a real conversation with this person, right? The conversation might actually be able to continue forward. Because here's the thing, far from being bad news, it's old news, right? But far from being bad news, the news that church is full of hypocrites should actually give us hope. Now that's quite a claim. So let me explain how, we're gonna, how I'm gonna unfold that for you today. First of all, we're gonna define what a hypocrite is, especially in the eyes of Jesus. We've got a good taste of that. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then we're gonna talk about how I can say that ev everyone's a hypocrite, right? The church is full of hypocrites. And third, let me explain why this is actually the best news you're probably gonna hear all week, right? So the word hypocrite actually comes from a, a Greek word, no surprise there. Uh, that you, is used to refer to an actor on the stage in a Greek play. Now, if you think back to high school and college and you studied Greek drama, one of the things you may recall is that in Greek drama, the actors wore masks. And the masks were highly stylized to represent the character that they were playing on the stage, right? And so the mask, for instance, would tell the audience that this actor I am Oedipus as, a, as an example, right? And of course the person behind the mask, his name's not Oedipus, he's an actor. He's Heracleides or something. I don't know, I just made that up, right? But some, some name like that, just some guy. Now the way the people of the world sees it, this is a good illustration of what they think is going on here in church, right? They think all of us church people are going around wearing this Jesus mask, this churchy mask pretending that we're all churchy and Jesus and everything. But when they look behind the mask, that's not what they see. They see you and me. And I know, I know when people look behind my mask, yeah, they're, yeah, they're seeing a lot of other things that aren't necessarily in alignment with Jesus. And what they see is that what, how they interpret all that is well, just, we're just all acting using the Jesus mask to make us look good, that's a key concept, look good, to cover up the mess we actually are behind the mask. So in their minds, church is just a mask that people wear so we can feel morally superior to people who don't go to church. That's the story that they tell themselves. And it's not always untrue, is it? Some of us have been around church for a long time and we've seen that. And maybe in a past, you know, some of us have been that on occasion. But here's something even crazier and tougher is that in some ways, Jesus agrees with them. He agrees with them. So when Jesus describes hypocrites, he's describing what amounts to in their day, the pastors and the deacons and the trustees, <laughs> in the religious establishment of their time. And I'll say he uses some pretty pungent language, right? This is basically verbal ammonia shoved up the nose, right? It is the way he's assaulting them. Jesus says, hypocrites, you are people, you hypocrites, you are people who make this huge deal about little bitty things and then completely ignore the huge things that are actually important and you should be doing all of it. Right. And then he goes on. Hypocrites are people who go to great lengths to look all clean and shiny on the outside, but they disregard the stuck on spoiled residue that coats the inside. Right? Jesus says hypocrites are people who arrange their lives to present a beautiful, organized outward appearance while inside they're just full of death and rottenness. Harsh stuff. And here's the part that really gets people. Here's where it kind of all comes to a point for people. Jesus says the hypocrites have the audacity to look down their noses at other people as if their success at looking good actually makes them better people. Hmm. And what Jesus kind of wraps up with there, he says, yeah, that's actually, 
it doesn't make you look better. It actually makes you worse. Now, have you known in your life church people who have used masks, that church is a mask to hide behind to do all kinds of bad things? Have you known people? Sure. So that definitely happens. The news is full of examples, right? Catholic priests, Protestant pastors, church treasurers, worship leaders, right? I don't need to read you the headlines. But the accusation that church is full of hypocrites, the people who use that accusation are actually kind of misusing the word. What they mean isn't quite that most times, in my observation. Here's why I say this, because embracing a high standard of morality, embracing a high standard of morality, but then failing to live up to it, that's not really hypocrisy, that's just being human. In fact, Martin Luther teaches us that this is exactly the position that Jesus, uh, that, that we Christians find ourselves in. And he's anchoring this to the discussion of uh, of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, if, if you remember, that's where Jesus says, yeah, if you just even speak contemptuously of another person, you're, you're like murdering them in your heart. If you're lusting after another person, you're like committing adultery in your heart. Jesus does not let us off the hook. He, 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 raised, he ups the ante on these things. So Martin Luther said, how are we supposed to understand this? He said, here's, here's how it works. He said, we are simultaneously, important word, simultaneously both justified, made right by Christ, and yet we are still sinners. Simultaneously saints and sinners. Not 50% and 50%, just both at the same time all the way through. And we readily admit that the law of God calls us to live holy lives. Is that not true? Right? The law of God calls us to live holy lives. But what the Bible teaches us is that the damage that sin has done to us runs so deep, only God can fix it. Only God can fix it. So we come to church because we're turning to Christ to fix it. Christ who died to take away our sin, who rose again to rescue us from the death that sin, that sin brings. See, the idea is by coming to church, we're not hiding our sin, we're confessing our sin and confessing that we need Christ because he's the only remedy to our sin. Do you see the dynamic? And I know you guys know this. I'm just helping you to understand when somebody throws this accusation at you, it doesn't need to throw you for a loop. You just need to remember what the real deal is because you're actually engaged in it. Our justification in Christ is not God giving us a second chance to get it right. That's also what a lot of people out there think. Instead, it's the basis of life on which all our hope rests only on the good news of Jesus. This is why it's so significant and why I included this passage in Romans when Paul says, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. He didn't say, oh, clean yourself up and then you're good, then I'll take care of the rest. He didn't say that. While we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, while we were still condemned, he died for us. And this is where church comes in, right? So author Caleb Keith explains it this way. He said, the truth is that Christians do not stand alone in this, but we need the church. We need the church. For the church, as we've often said, is not a building. It is the proclamation of the word of God and the administration of his gifts. Although the devil and the world and our sinful flesh may assail us, they cannot snatch us from his hand. Thanks be to God that we are not left in our sin alone, but we are given Christ and his gospel. Amen. Amen. And the means by which Christ has ordained that we should receive Christ in his gospel, guess what? It's through his church. As messy <laughs> as we are, as it is, we are the means through which we receive Christ and his gospel. And Jesus addressed this directly, as I, as I said, in another place, in Matthew chapter 9, when he was questioned 
by some more of these religious leaders who asked how Jesus could be so unconcerned about holiness and purity, so unconcerned that he would actually share a dinner table with gangsters and criminals and prostitutes. And, and Jesus, I, I, I'm, I'm imagining this picture of him hearing this question and he turns to them and he just looks at them and he says, isn't it the sick people who need a doctor? Not those who are healthy. He went on to say, you need to learn what the scripture means. <laughs> He's saying this to the religious leaders. You need to learn what the scripture means. Talk about ammonia up the nose, right? The scripture says, I don't want animal sacrifices. I want you to show kindness to people. I did not come to invite good people. I came to invite sinners. So when people say to us, church is full of hypocrites, you can agree with them. Sure it is. Because that is, if you mean that church is full of sinners, that's a self-evident point, or it ought to be. And you can also point out to them that that argument, it's like complaining that it's complaining that hospitals uh, are, are bad because they're full of sick people. Right? Of course, oh, I don't know. hospitals are full of sick people. Yes, of course they are. That's the whole point. Hospitals are where sick people go to be made well. And churches where sinners go, like me and like you, to receive into ourselves by the proclamation of the gospel and the participation in his table that Jesus took away our sin upon the cross. And we are saved by his grace through faith in him unto good works that we do for him. And... To, to stretch this metaphor a little further, we understand that a disease, for instance, like cancer, the treatment is a process. It's not a one pill, one and done deal. A cancer patient has to go back again and again and again until the cancer is gone. Sin is a much worse disease than cancer. And we too must return for treatment again and again, and again. And we know that one day when Christ returns, he will forever destroy the corruption of sin within us and all its effects on the world. And we shall all live cancer-free forever in God's good new earth. Amen? Church isn't a mask. It's a hospital. This is the challenge, right? People are mistaken. They, they get the wrong metaphor. They got the wrong metaphor. Church is on a mask. It's a hospital. And those who use church to mask their sin, they will have to faith, face Jesus when that time comes. And that's their story, right? Remember, remember in Narnia, when uh, Lucy got a little curious about other people's stories and Aslan growls and said, nope, that's their story. You never mind. You just stick with your story. So don't worry. Jesus will deal with those people who really are hypocrites. We should leave their destiny to him. But let me leave you with this. It is important. The call that is before us is to examine ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit to ask ourselves, where in our lives are we wearing masks? And I don't mean COVID masks now, right? I'm talking theater masks. To make ourselves look clean and shiny and beautiful on the outside. Right. There's a term that, that you may have heard bounce around. It's called virtue signaling. And virtue signaling is little things we say and do, post on social media or whatever, designed to make us look a certain way that we want to present ourselves to the world. And it happens on all sides of the spectrum, right? Left and right, up and down, liberal, conservative, everybody, right? Let's be aware of where we're virtue signaling to make ourselves look good on the outside, trying to make our family and our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers think that we're, you know, we've got it all together. Here's the thing. We can shout, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain all we want. <laughs> but the fact is the curtain's open. People know what's going on back there. Jesus is very clear. There will come a day when all that has been hidden will be revealed. 
So is church your hospital or is it your mass? And not just church, right? What other parts of your lives are you masking up to look good instead of confessing and letting Jesus take it for you? Speaker Jim Rohn uh, was very influential on me in the earlier part of my life. And he talked about how part of being an effective communicator is identifying with the people with whom you are speaking. And he, he had this really powerful reminder. He said, when you're telling stories about yourself, just remember, people don't identify with your victories. What they identify with is your struggles. Meaning we don't have to wear a mask in front of our neighbors and our friends and our relatives. We can be who we really are with them. We can admit, yeah, I'm a sinner. That's why I go to church, because I need Jesus. We can help our friends and our neighbors see that we come here because we need a hospital and that they're welcome to join us and get treatment too. Because Jesus and only Jesus is the one who can fix what ails us. And this is why I keep hammering it every Sunday. Jesus Christ is good news for all people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, indeed.